Welcome back to my disembodied voice. Today, I want to talk about one of my favourite movies of recent years, Promising Young Woman. Oh, and before we get underway, spoiler alert for pretty much the whole of the film. Now, this isn't a review of the movie, it's more of a character study and an analysis of its lead protagonist Cassie and the psychological effects of her PTSD, which causes her behaviour, drives the plot and ultimately ends in tragedy. Cassie is a former medical student now living at home, working in a dead-end coffee shop and generally full of malice towards the whole human race. It turns out that the reason for this is because her best friend Nina was raped while severely intoxicated at med school and, due to no one believing her, ended up taking her own life. Cassie was unable to come to terms with this and, such was her ire and grief, she dropped out of medical school and began a new crusade going to bars at night, pretending she is drunk, and then, when the kind man gets her home and starts to take advantage of her faked comatose state, she sits up and asks them, what are they doing, and thus leaves them at the sharp end of a very damaging accusation. Maybe Cassie is trying to recondition the men, maybe she's putting herself in danger, such as her recklessness, or maybe she's recreating something she will never come to terms with. Promising Young Woman is a revenge film and, as discussed in a previous video, the trope of revenge films is that an egregious act of violence goes unpunished, so the scales of justice must be balanced by an even more egregious act of vengeance which returns the pain in earnest. Now, Promising Young Woman is a little different here in the fact that, although the villain, Al Monroe, was the one who raped Nina and thus the final antagonist, there are others who are indirectly complicit in Nina's death who must face their judgement via a right of humiliation rather than being physically hurt or killed. Also, in another left turn of the revenge genre, the rapist in this film actually kills the protagonist at the very end and thus gives Cassie a true fallen arc. Cassie's victims are all, in true revenge fashion, given an ironic taste of their own medicine. The best being the Dean, who, refusing to believe Nina at her lowest ebb when she needed someone to most, is tricked in a wonderful confrontation of mental chess into believing her own daughter is now at the frat house where the sexual assault happened. Watching the Dean smirk turn to rage and then begging before an acceptance of failing all in the space of a few seconds is fantastic and, although far from the atrocities if I spit on your grave, it's a comeuppance which doesn't need extreme violence. Sometimes less is more and it gets the point across perfectly. But let's diverge from all that for a while and look at Cassie's grief and the PTSD she experiences from losing her best friend. Now, PTSD can have introverted or extroverted symptoms, and these can be both passive or aggressive. By this I mean that one can either live inside emotional flashbacks and be crippled by intrusive thoughts or nightmares, isolate themselves at home, or even find themselves racked with guilt that ends up being metabolised through things like alcohol, consumption or self-harm. Cassie is more extroverted. She attacks the world which has wronged her rather than hide from it. So, in terms of her symptoms, she meets the PTSD diagnosis by the following list of four symptoms. Number one, always being on guard for danger. Number two, self-destructive behaviour. Number three, irritability, angry outburst or aggressive behaviour. And number four, overwhelming guilt or shame. Right at the start of the film, Cassie meets Ryan a boy from her previous med school, and he is the catalyst for Cassie's personal arc. Nina's death was the activating event, which of course we don't see. But, now stuck in a loop, Ryan is the choice for Cassie to accept and move on, or simply just leave him behind and remain consumed by her guilt. Clearly a bit wet, but very smitten, Ryan tries hard to date Cassie, but ends up with spit in his coffee, and then, once the ice is finally chipped, he gets several dates of zero contact and emotionally sealed off Cassie. This is the first part of Cassie's PTSD, always on guard for danger. Ryan is something good but resentful of all men and on a mission to avenge Nina. His charm and wit is repeatedly battered away but there are several scenes where she makes the effort and lowers the guard to try and let him in. The problem is that each time Ryan tries to move to the physical stage, Cassie bats him away and, in one scene, when they fail to kiss after a date, she ends up kicking over a bin in frustration at her own self-defence mechanisms, which are keeping her focused and purposeful, but now inhibiting her life. In terms of self-destructive behaviour, the second point, Cassie doesn't drink or take drugs or cut herself. Instead, she recreates the scene Nina found herself in when she was too drunk to say no and, thus with no capacity and consent inhibited, she was left vulnerable. Cassie shows another sign of her PTSD here better known as re-victimisation, where she recreates the same scenario over and over again. 
Now, Cassie cannot be re-victimized as she wasn't the one who was raped, but by creating the same scenario again and again and staying in that moment where she couldn't help Nina, she's putting herself through hell because her guilt almost needs it. Cassie is doing this because she wants to trick as many men possible and had they kept part of the original script where Cassie came home with bruises on her where this plan had sometimes gone wrong, you would have seen her self-destructive PTSD symptoms really come through. Cassie is undergoing re-victimisation vicariously on Nina's behalf, but the intention is to get to the point of sexual assault but stop it. The problem with this is that she's not getting over anything. Her behaviour is merely keeping her stuck in the moment of Nina being raped over and over and over again. So, this covers our self-destructive behaviour, but due to hunting down her victims and thus not focusing on her own life, her parents are left desperate for her to have move out and even her friend is telling her to get a life. She's accidentally harming herself now because her life is falling apart and she's stuck in the past, cutting off all the positives and good things and staying in a place which is safe but malignant. Many PTSD survivors fall into a freeze mentality where guilt and trauma keep them in the same place and they simply cope maladaptively just to manage. In other words, they're coping with coping, which means they're always stuck inside a circular loop of repetition rather than progression. Cassie's personality is pure irritation. Right from the opening scenes, she is vile, hostile and downright rude. She pushes people away including her own parents. And this is where the charm with Ryan forms as, considering most people want nothing to do with her, he sees her true personality and is determined to break it down. Cassie is rage-filled and, even when talking revenge with the Dean, she keeps her cool but has nothing but hatred for those who contributed towards Nina's death. It's part of what makes my favourite scene in the movie, where she finds out that her boyfriend Ryan has watched Nina's rape as she is given mobile phone footage of it and she threatens to ruin his life. Ryan begs for forgiveness, although never apologises, before snapping and calling her a failure. At the very point where their love had been the strongest, his betrayal reactivates the PTSD and trauma he had helped cure and she returns to the on-guard, aggressive and dangerous state. By this point though, his betrayal is the final straw and, setting out for her final target, there's an inevitability of tragedy looming such as Cassie's mood of nothing left to live for. Her boyfriend lied to her, she now truly has nothing at all and all that work getting past the detrimental signs and symptoms of her PTSD are shattered and she's back in the place of unbearable guilt and torment. Finally, the overwhelming guilt and shame is what drives Cassie to her revenge and ultimately her death. She wasn't there to protect her friend when she needed her. She didn't stop the suicide and, right at the end, she realises she's been sleeping with a man who cheered while Al Monroe gleefully raped Nina. It's too much to bear and surely, now unable to trust anyone ever again, she may as well head to her death or, at the very best, a revenge too dark to come back from. I mentioned Ryan was the catalyst and he not only saves Cassie, but he ruins her. Ryan destroys her with lies and having rebuilt her and enabled her to live again, he leaves her with the guilt and shame of lowering her defence mechanism, the thing that kept her safe, only to do the worst thing possible and be involved, albeit as a bystander, in Nina's sexual assault. Cassie isn't far from Batman in terms of her mental state, and bear with me here and let me explain. Haunted by something she could have prevented, she's now on a mission which she will never bring Nina back and has no good resolution, but, unable to see anything beyond the feelings which are choking her, she's a walking shell stuck in the past. Take the scene where she sits watching photos of Nina on her laptop, sitting in her bedroom staring as photos of Nina go on and off, the light flashing as she sits alone in the dark. Her room, by the way, remains very childlike in its decor and presentation, another nod to where she is right now, living in the past when Nina was alive and they were young and happy. It's worth noting that Cassie is grieving throughout the film and it also explains her behaviour. However, whilst her grief is apparent, it's the continuous seeking out of men to trick and ruin, that returning through the same events and all the recklessness, withdrawal, hostility and self-destruction that shows that Nina's death hasn't just upset her, it has traumatised her and left her with an insatiable guilt she will never get over. Because Nina took her own life, leaving Cassie helpless and forever left with the question of what she could have done better, she is avenging Nina's death both for vengeance and a way of making up for her failure to stop what happened. Promising Young Woman is not a traditional revenge movie, but for me, its explanations and character studies make it even more exceptional, because the aggressor here isn't the one who was sexually assaulted or had to watch her family die by gunmen. She's the best friend who should have stopped this, the best friend who didn't do enough and now needs to put it right. She's left in a permanent state of trauma and, because no one believed Nina, all the jigsaw pieces need to receive their retribution, not just the aggressor. Promising Young Woman is a wonderful study of PTSD and the fallen arc someone can go on when consumed and lost to the mental effects of something they cannot get past. 
For Cassie, she loses her life to this fixation and, although her cunning makes sure that Al Monroe gets unrested and Ryan's life will be ruined, it's a bittersweet ending for someone who, at the beginning of the third act of the movie, had let go and moved on, only for the very person who saved her to be the thing which meant she could never be the same again. Anyway, it's time to play Angel of the Morning, release that text, and until next time, I'll catch you later.